I'm here. What would you like to know? Okay, what I would like to know is how did you and Tom get together and how did you meet and how did you become a part of Naughty Puncture? Yeah, okay. Um, well, Tom and I go back to about 1993, 94. Um, and at that time I was in an ELP tribute band, UK one called Works Three. Um, and Tom was in Noddy's Puncture, or there was Noddy's Puncture, but it, it, it wasn't exclusively an ELP tribute band. And I'm sure Tom will talk more about that later. Um, but he used to come down to watch our gigs and I used to go and see his gigs. So we, we kind of kept in contact through the 90s. We both played at the ELP convention in 95, uh, the 25th anniversary. Um, yeah. and that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, we, we go back a long way. And, um, and then it, then jump forward to 2010. In fact, uh, high voltage, which is 10 years ago tomorrow. Can you believe that? But anyway, I was chatting to Tom, and he was just we were just chatting about Noddy's puncture, and uh, and I just said to him, look, you know, if at any time in the future you need a, a help with a drummer, I'd be more than happy to uh, to look at that. And um, then I got the call, late 2015, I think it was. Um, can you help me out with some rehearsals? And um, we can do online rehearsals, even though we're 400 miles apart. So we, we, got, uh, we got together on the internet and um, started, um, started working together. And, um, and then, yeah, that's how I joined Noddy's Puncture. And first gig, actually the first gig was December 2016 um, in Rochdale. Wow. And, uh, wow. and Ed was already in the band, but again, he'll talk about how he was uh, involved, but um, we've never looked back really. And it's been a it's been a journey, a really good journey. Now, uh, Ed, how did you become involved with Naughty's Puncture, and how did you how did you hear about Naughty's Puncture, and then become um, an actual member? Actual member, yeah. Well, I was um, I was trawling trawling on YouTube for just some entertainment, basically, and. Um, yeah, Emerson Lake and Palmer to listen to, and uh, look, come across uh, a video of uh, Doddy's Puncture playing a track, and uh, I thought it was really, really good. Um, didn't expect that, that sort of quality from a from a tribute band, and sure. sort of a, it raised my curiosity. Um, so I just followed them through and uh, went to their website and noticed that uh, their bass player had left them. And uh, this was 2011, 2011. And uh, so I sent an email saying that um, you, your, your bass player has left you. Uh, I'm interested in, in, in doing something. I'm a, I'm a guitar, guitar vocalist um, and interested in, uh, in, in, in doing it. So uh, we arranged a, a meeting. I went down to Tom's place, um, 200 miles away. And uh, we, uh, we, we met in his basement and uh, had all of the stuff set up like you see uh, on the, in the picture there. Um, and I, he, played, um, he played stuff from Tarkas and Pictures Exhibition. And I was I hearing- have, I didn't have this then yet though, Ed. It was a mini Moog here. Ah, uh, it was a mini Moog, <laughs> yeah. It was just, just small stuff. But uh, he played, uh, played Tarkas, he played uh, Pictures Exhibition. Uh, real Hammonds, that's what really got me. It was Real Hammonds sounds I was listening to. And uh, it was absolutely spot on. Everything was, everything was, was just so good. Uh, the, 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 the quality of the musicianship I was hearing was just, uh, it was just excellent. So um, that's, that's how we sort of, uh, we, we, we slowly got into it. And um, I went away and I said that uh, I have to learn all the bass parts because I'm a guitar player. So I uh, learned, um, learned uh, some of the stuff that uh, we arranged to, to get together initially and uh, then uh, took it from there. Uh, it's, it sounded, sounded quite good, just the two of us. Um, mm -hmm. Then uh, we, had a, we had a drummer at the time and uh, we just started to come together. We, it's difficult to, uh, to, to arrange um, rehearsals and the, to the extent that you need to get this stuff together. Um, so we sure. started to look, we started to look at uh, online methods, and um, we, uh, we we managed to do uh, e jamming eventually, 
which was uh, quite a quite a learning curve and difficult, but uh, we got over that. And uh, learning online with with uh, delays in our ears and everything, we managed to learn uh, pictures exhibition. We managed to Tarkus. We managed to learn uh, some of um, uh, the first impression. So that's uh, quite a quite a good achievement for uh, for something that was uh, not too easy to do online. Um, so I that, agree with that. As to where we are now. And here yeah. we are. <laughs> and here we are. Now we have with us Tom. Tom, are you the founder of Naughty's Puncture? How did Naughty's Puncture become Naughty's Puncture with I am, Frank I am, and with that? I am the founder, yes. You can hear me all right. Yeah. Got we can. Yes, microphone. I can hear you. You can hear you yeah, just um, fine, I think. Good old. Um, uh, yeah, I was in a band. Um, uh, we're quite well known around here. Uh, we're doing original stuff. Um, it was called Shanghai, and um, I was allowed uh, an Emerson Lake and Palmer number. I used to do a medley of fanfare and blues variation, <clears throat> and we did we did uh, other covers. You know, the, the the guys in the band were like um, Deep Purple fans, and you know, and we did some original stuff. In fact, we had uh, we made. Uh, we went in studio three, three, two or three times, yeah, and um, and then that split, and and at the time uh, the guy who was singing, uh, the last singer when when the split happened, uh, he was a, he was also a drummer. He was always I, re I remembered him getting onto the. We used to practice in this basement, and he, he always used to when we had a tea break, he used to get on the drum kit, and he was quite a good drummer. Uh, so I just asked him. I said, I fancy getting a. Uh, sort of a, an ELP, do more ELP, would you fancy sort of uh, playing along? And he said, okay. Uh, but he wasn't an ELP fan, that was the problem. And, um, you know, you'd play, uh, you'd play Rondo and it wasn't the, you know, the dun -dun 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 -dun, the train thing. It was a more, more like a bum chick, bum bum chick, you know. So it was like, you know, dead, 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 dead. you know, playing to it was a bit strange. But, uh, but we got it going. And he actually was, was singing as well. He had a headset mic, he was a good singer. So he used to sing at the drums. But then we got a bassist in and they told me, uh, we'll do this if we can do some numbers we like. So uh, uh, we want to do, uh, can't, uh, can't get enough of your love, is it? Um, uh, uh, who was that by? Um, bad bad company. company. Bad company. Yeah, uh, sure. free, wishing well, Lenny Kravitz, you're going to go my way, which was quite good actually, because I could get guitar sounds on my keyboards, you know, and do stuff. And we did, uh, uh, we did Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, Beethoven's Ninth. Did Frankenstein, um, didn't you? Frankenstein, Edgar Winter, yeah. So it was, it was a mishmash, but um, there's quite a lot of ELP in. So, um, and then uh, that carried on. I did the convention with those guys. Uh, it was weird because the bass player was into Duran uh, Duran and the, his bass solo in Rondo was uh, that uh, bass solo, is it out of Rio? No, not Rio, um, something else. There's a bass solo, anyway. No, but, 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 with, 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 with saxophone over the top, and I learned that sax line on the, played it on the Moog. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and then that, that split, uh, that, that um, ended up, um, well, it's basically just long stories, really, but I, I won't go into details. That ended, and I just decided I needed um, ELP fans uh, to, to do it properly, but of course you're not going to find ELP fans in the same t street or the same town, so you have to go further afield. So, and it's gone through a few lineups. You know, ELP fans came and went, and uh, and um, we, we are here where we are at the moment. So, and it's a great place to be, I have to say. You need you need ELP fans to play this stuff. You know, if you get you get a good musician and say there's Tarkas and there's Pirates. They might learn it, but it won't sound right. You need someone who's been listening to this stuff since they were like yes. 12, you know? Yeah, yeah. Tom, you're dead right, you, you're dead right about that. Um, we, we, are, we are people who listen to this stuff from, from year and one. It's a great from when, to from be, when it, I have to say. From when it uh, was first released and uh, it just logs in your brain and you, 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 you know you have that in your in your mind. You know the first impression. You know Tarkas, and uh, you can you, you can relive it through your brain. Um, 
And when it comes to learning it, you know exactly what you're supposed to be trying to do. So uh, someone who's not a fan, um, it must be so, so difficult to, uh, to, to comprehend how to do it. Yeah. To get it right, I think the little nuances, isn't it, that um, you pick up through listening to over the years um, and different versions and different um, different tours, and you you really, it's not that you get into the music, but the music gets into you. And um, as yeah. as, uh, as Tom alluded to there, if, if you can get other musicians that can play all the notes, um, but it's trying to get the feel, um, and we try and recreate the live. ELP experience. So we always refer to live versions when we're approaching a new piece uh, rather than the studio version because. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I, we, could, very nice. I could jump in there because, uh, for example, like Frank said, the live versions. Uh, so we based our Tarkus on the Welcome Back My Friends version because obviously it's got that mega Moog solo in, Moog solo. So you've got to do it. But having said, that, having said that, some of the organ solos, I like some licks in the studio version. So what I've tried to do is, uh, is go into, uh, into, the, uh, into the studio version and then put a little bit of a, of a live lick into it and alter it. But in doing so, you think, well, hang on a minute. As I go from one to the other, I'll just put what, one of my own licks in, something I've done, I've made up. So it's a big mishmash, but um, you, you tend to go, I like that bit. From there, and I like that bit from there. So you, and it sort of, you get used to it. It, uh, it sort of uh, becomes the way you do it, you know. No, so, it's a little part of you, you know, yeah. yourself mixing right in there with what was uh, played by you know Pete. Anyway, for, carry on, Frank, because I interrupted you there. Uh, I think that's. About, I think also um, uh, um, when when we were doing pictures at an exhibition, um, Tom sort of obviously told told me in, uh, from the drumming point of view anyway to refer to the live version from 71 and then and then he'd phone up and say oh i've listened lis i listened to this bootleg from 1972 at such and such a venue there's a bit in there that you know and so i've got he then sent me the link and i've got to listen to the bootleg bit and then you know and so tom's attention to detail um is not just listening to the live versions that you can buy uh, you know, the normal CD releases, but scours through all the bootlegs for other little bits that we can add because their pieces developed over the years. Like, like Tom said about, we play Tarkas from 74 because it developed from the original 71 studio to, to something that was a completely different animal really in 74. Um, and the same yeah. with, with pictures and, um, and other pieces. So yeah, we, we, we tend to refer to different live recordings, um, both bootlegs and uh, commercial releases. And you know, Frank, on that note, talking about pictures, there is uh, something that you do uh, that Carl used to do with his violin bow. And if you wouldn't mind, I think uh, everyone would love to see you demonstrate how he was able to make the sounds that he was that he made with his bow. Yeah. So I, I, and I'll just give you the story because I just got a phone call from Tom and he just said, Frank, you've got to buy a violin bow. And I said, what do you mean a violin bow? We're not, you know, we're not, we're not playing Vivaldi's Four Seasons. We're playing ELP. You know, you've got the wrong guy here. No, 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 no. You, <laughs> need, you, need, to listen, you need to listen to the Japanese bootleg from 1932 because, um, and forgive me, I can't remember. It's, it's not the hut of Baba Yaga, is it, Tom? It's the... What, what part? It's the, the um, it's that it's the it's during the bass bit where it goes wow yeah, yeah. wow wow. Yeah. So what Carl did, yeah. he, he got a so violin. Used to, Carl used to play violin before drum. You know that when he was eleven, he played violin, um, and he gets a violin bow and he he, he plays it on a cymbal, and uh, he kind of gets some eerie sounds from it. I'll try and replicate some of them. Have you uh, put your rosin on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can pick this up, but um, you'll sort of get. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear it. And when um, when Ed is playing his kind of bass parts, then the the violin parts uh, interact with that, and um, 
So that wasn't on the original live recording from 71 that you can buy. That was, uh, again, a, a, an example of, of them developing and uh, coming up with new ideas. You can hear it on lots of bootlegs. Yeah. From later on. If you watch our, uh, we did a little collaboration thing, uh, didn't we, uh, video, and we did pictures, and, uh, and Frank got his violin bow just in time. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. It's that's on there. excellent. Excellent. And you know, I think I'm going to take this opportunity to ask Dave to introduce himself because I'm sure a lot of people are saying, Dave, how are you involved with Naughty Puncher and what is it that you do? Okay, so um, my sort of background is, you know, right from school, I was into ELP, um, buying all the albums when they came out playing them until I practically wore out the records, you know, listening to the whole thing. Um, got into bands playing myself as well, uh, but not in Tom's league at all in playing. Um, but uh, 20 years ago, um, just before the turn of the century, um, <laughs> uh, Tom used to be quite active on a discussion group on the internet called uh, ELP Disc. And from there, I saw about Noddy's Puncher doing gigs. Um, fortunately, I lived relatively close to Rochdale. Uh, and there was a gig up in uh, Littleborough that I went to see. At the uh, lake? Say, yep. Um, <laughs> just, just over 20 years ago. And went in, saw the gear on stage, um, heard them play and was totally blown away. Uh, version of Rondo are recognised as uh, the Elegy version with every scrape and distortion and twang uh, accurate to the record. Um, and it was superb. Went to see him as many times as I possibly could. Uh, and then uh, just before Ed joined, um, I casually mentioned to Tom, if you ever need a pair of hands helping cart all that gear, I'm relatively local, so I'll, I'll give you a hand. Uh, and then said, uh, you know, uh, so I can find my way around a mixing desk because I've done sound since 1979. And he, uh, he, he sort of snatched my hand off. <laughs> and then the, I've been involved ever since in uh, one form or another. And I need uh, to help I, even more now, don't I? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> w when it's two o'clock in the morning and it's dark and it's raining and we're unloading a van into Tom's garage and, and the uh, trailer, <laughs> yeah, uh, carrying the stuff down into the cellar, etc., then uh, that, that's that's what I owe it to. But like you say, it saves on gym membership. It saves on gym <laughs> membership, and obviously anybody looking at me will realise. <laughs> Uh, the, the vast improvement it's made to my physique. Uh, <laughs> but no, it, it's, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You hear every note close to, you see how the pieces were put together. Uh, there's nothing like watching it being played in front of your very eyes. Uh, so I feel in a privileged position because uh, I've always loved the music and these are a great bunch of guys. Uh, Tom, you know, well, they've all become really good friends. Uh, but like I say, Tom have known like over 20 years now. So, uh, yeah, that, that's how I got in. You know, it seems like all of you have um, had a lot of time, a lot of years together. And um, that's very impressive. Yeah, I mean, When I you're an ELP fan... Frank, when you're an ELP fan, uh, you, you sort of, you, it's, it's a love, it's, it's a labour of love and uh, you want to do the best that you can in the band and uh, it takes a long time to get it together. It does. You can't join a band and just uh, be in it for six months, you, not not ELP. And that's why, oh, I mean, yeah. I'd be happy yeah. 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 I think ELP yeah, fans are sure. like a family as well, you know. I've... I, there's one guy we became very friendly with, um, Gra Graham Allen, who comes to all our gigs. And um, him and I, although I've only known him for about 25, maybe 25 years, because we, we used, we've been to the same gigs before we knew each other, we could, 
it, it almost was as if that we knew each other for a lot longer because we could talk about gigs that we'd both been to separately, not known that we'd known each other. And, and I think ELP fans, uh, you don't have to have known an ELP fan for a long time, but you feel that you've known them forever because, you know, you, you go, you, the music takes you back to when you were younger and, and you all have that connection, uh, uh, not just collectively, but individually as well. Sure, absolutely. And you know what? I think at this time, Tom, I'd love to see you demonstrate something. Oh, are we at that bit now? That <laughs> wonderful system because I know that I am very anxious to hear something from you. Okay. I've been thinking of demonstration things. I do, I do synthesize the demonstrations. I take this on to, into synth meets, you know. Um, so I do do a little bit of demonstrating and do some talking as well. Yeah, quite used to it. Uh, so, can you all hear me? Can. I yeah. can. There we go. That's the whole down sound for you. Yeah. <laughs> Now the whole down sound is very, very difficult to achieve. <laughs> um, basically, your oscillators need to be in tune. There's no, there's no room for beating. Uh, by beating, I mean, uh, if I turn these off, if you've got... Can you hear how it goes static? The movement stops. Uh, it's, it's, you need to set each bank up so that the movement stops, otherwise it can sound totally out. And there's, a, there's a sustain. Without the sustain, which you actually turn off during the solo because you do the middle solo, which isn't that sound, you have to turn it off. But then you need to bring it back in again at the end. Now, you know, there's the bit where it goes. Um... And then he goes into the solo, yeah? So. M Mo used to play on that sound. He used to, if you keep, if you don't let it re-trigger, you get this. And he used to do that before he went into the solo. Um, I, I, I can actually, um, yeah, I can demonstrate you. What you do is you switch. He had presets. I don't, you see. So I have to turn. I've, I've done my own modifications. I can turn banks off, so I can actually do that. That glide down. And then turn them off, and I just got the the one for the solo, and I turn the thing off, and I go. But then you come back into it, you turn that up again, so it carries on sustaining, and you do the. Now, I've done a little modification here on mine because I don't think Keith had this. I had an idea whereby you can get rid of that on the glide up. It's quite a good effect. Can I actually do all sorts of things that I actually don't do live? I should do really, but you stick to the same solo, but you can actually do things like And 
it's just uh, you can just go wild. And then when when you're ready, you're back. So that's the whole damn sound demonstrated. <laughs> yeah. What else would you like, like to know? Favorite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it could go on and on and on. I'd like to go to Ed. And Ed, would you mind doing a little demonstration on your, um, you have vocals and you have bass and guitar. And I think people would love to um, hear a little piece about uh, your sound. Yeah. The, fir the, first, uh, the first time I heard yeah, Emerson Ling Palmer, was at a friend's house who had bought the first album. And um, I heard uh, the, the Lucky Man song. And what, what really killed me was, it was just an, a, an acoustic song, someone singing along to an acoustic guitar. But at the end, there was this massive, massive wall of, uh, of sound, which I'd never heard before. Um, and I was just so curious as to how it was created and what made that sound. Uh, and that sort of uh, fueled my enthusiasm for to, for to take it further and look into to their music. But uh, Lucky Man was the first, first thing that I ever heard that, um, that kind of sort of uh, drew me to the music. Uh, so, just do a few, few bars. I don't, don't know if Tom would uh, <laughs> join in with the solo. <laughs> I'll try, Ooh. but there might be a the delay might make it. Uh... <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so very well and it speaks to 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 me i know reminds me of um you know greg doing that and it's a beautiful song it, it really 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 uh you know, opens your soul and just the i couldn't help but just close my eyes and just go off into <laughs> kind of dreamland and it's a very, very good thing. We have a lot of comments here that I didn't even notice. Um, let's see. Um, let me see what do we have here. Uh, we have some people watching. Uh, we have Robert Shepard. Hi, Robert. And um, he is... Um, let's see, Terry um, Schwartz. Walder and uh, oh man, Terry, I hope I got your last name right. 
Um, he says, uh, is replying to Sandy, who said she has opened uh, another live link because she was having trouble, I guess, with um, getting all of our um, sound or, or, or uh, I think it was the sound. And uh, so she opened up another link and she told people how to fix that. So um, let me see, Adam is, Adam Fenton is watching. Robert Soul is watching, look at this. We have, uh, we have Manticore all tuning in. Hi Manticore. Hi um, Manticore. <laughs> <laughs> So this is wonderful. Now there are some things that we've talked about um, that I think that uh, we wanted we wanted to bring up during this this interview. And um, everyone out there, let us know if you're having any difficulty with our audio. Uh, please let us know because for us over here, we're hearing everybody just fine, but that doesn't necessarily mean that so are you. So, um, yes, just please give us a little heads up so that we can do something different. Um, now, how did the name Naughty's Puncture come to be? Yes, that's, uh, that's a very cool name. I really like oh, it. Isn't it? Uh, I, I, I never th knew I thought a lot. You thought of that, Tom. Yeah. Okay, explain, yeah. Tom. Well, I've, I've, uh, well, of course, Carl had a nuddy on his kick drum. We all know that, don't we? I don't. It was holding, it was holding a big banner saying Cal Palmer. It was a present to him when he was in Atomic Rooster, and apparently it was quite rude because it had something drawn on it, and um, of course, Carl was, Carl was making it like, you know, television appearances and stuff. So they had to uh, brush the, 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 the appendage out that was on. <laughs> um, so, um, so then, of course, it, it, somebody, I think somebody bought him the skin for his birthday or something. I seem to remember the story. And then, and then of course, we're, with the LP, he just um, carried, carried, had, had, this, had that skin on and uh, for, the, for, for how long? I don't know, maybe six months. Uh, so. Yeah, because in 71, he got the carpet on his face. Carcass one, yeah. It was uh, a, a relatively short time, really. So I just wanted to get Noddy on the kick drum. That's all it was to do with. And I thought, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get Noddy on the kick drum, but then we can't call the band Noddy. Because everyone will think we're a Slade tribute or something, you know. <laughs> so so I, I had an Eni Blyton book, because I've always been a Noddy fan anyway. And, uh, and uh, I noticed he had a little car. So I thought, I had this idea, I thought, ah, we'll stick him in his car, because Carl's got him on his kick drum holding this, holding this banner saying Carl. I thought, we'll put Noddy in the car with the flat tyre and call it Noddy's Puncture. I thought it was a stroke of genius. <laughs> Is that what you have at the uh, end of your uh, keeper set? Say again? You have the car at the end of your uh, keyboard? Yeah, I've, I've got, uh, somebody bought me that for Christmas many years ago, yeah. Sp it's made of sponge. It's a sponge. <laughs> Very <nodding>. awesome. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. So that's how, that's awesome. how that came about. Yeah. But it's, it's so, been that long now. Everybody knows it. So if we change the name, I didn't want to call the band. You see, I, I mean, there weren't that many tributes around then. I just didn't want to talk, call the band, you know, you know, whatever, you know, after a yeah. track of an album track or, a, or an album name, I want it to be different, you know? Yeah. So I just picked yeah. something to do with uh, Cal's kick drum. <laughs> I think you. I think it's a great name. I mean, it's very different. Gets people talking, it's doesn't it? Memorable. Ah. It's just memorable. Mm. It cer certainly uh, get does get people talking. It, it, at least to say, uh, uh, where did that name come from? Mm. Exactly. I, I know that some people have asked on um, our Titan site. Where'd that name come from? How did it get that? And what does it mean? Hi. So thank you for clearing that up for us. Now we all know exactly you go. where it came from. And I, I know that we were not able to see some uh, comments before. I apologize for not addressing those right away. But 
I do have a second system set up here. So I am able to see comments now. And uh, so please share your questions and whatnot because I am able to observe those uh, right here in front of me. Um, and uh, moving along, uh, Tom, let's see, your relationship with Keith mm -hmm. is, of course, a, a conversation that so many of us want to know even more about. Um, mm -hmm. How did you, you and, and Keith, how did you meet? What, what brought the two of you together uh, in the I, first uh, place? I basically went down to his house, knocked on the door and said, are you coming for a beer? I did not. I did, but he wasn't in. <laughs> <laughs> was, were, you, uh, was, were you promptly shown was being, the door? He was being best man at Jim Davidson's number, wedding number, whatever. <laughs> oh, no. That was eighth <laughs> wedding, wasn't it? Uh, uh, basically, what happened? Uh, there was no internet then. Um, there were some fanzines, and um, uh, we're talking 19, just after E.L. Powell. Um, basically, Greg was gigging, and I went to Greg's gig in Manchester. And I went during the day, and I started chatting to the guys who were setting up and stuff. It was the Manchester uh, University, you missed. Uh, and it was, the, you know, the Gary Moore band, Greg Lake band with Gary Moore. And um, uh, I was chatting to a guy and, and I got friendly with this, with this guy and he said, oh, you got, um, um, he said, um, Keith, Keith Emerson got me this job um, um, doing lights or something. For, for, uh, he said, yeah, I said, all right. He said, well, we're sat in a pub in, you know, he's a biker and I'm a biker and we were chatting in, uh, in this pub in Hailsham in Sussex. So I thought, okay, so there's a pub in Hailsham that Keith goes to, okay, fine. And then there was also um, this fanzine, which I, I can't remember what it's called now, but um, you know, you bought it and it was like photocopied. And um, there, was a mention of a, there was a mention of a name of a pub, the Six Bells. So I thought, well, Six Bells and Hailsham, I thought oh, I've got two bits of information here. Um, so ba basically I decided, I, 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 I must follow this through. I'll just, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and find the guy. It must be easy to find. Uh, and at the time in Rochdale, then you could go down to the library and you could get a phone, phone book for every uh, part of England. So I, I went and got a phone book for Sussex and, uh, and around that area. And I looked and that, I just went through the Emersons and I, and I sort of phoned a few of them. And uh, you did. I, I sort of said, you know, blah, 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 thinking coming down, blah, 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 blah. And I actually rang his house. He was in the phone book. Uh, he went up to his house. He went up to his house. Eleanor he answered. Know you at all. Eleanor answered. I remember because I just put two and two together after after the event. But I basically phoned up and said to the people, "I'm thinking of coming down. You know, are you any relation? You know, blah 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 blah. Do you know him? You know, blah blah blah." Uh, and I, I, actually, I think Eleanor said to me. Uh, oh right, I know him. She said, "Yeah, I know him. I've heard of him." She said, uh, "You know," and I, she said, "If you, if you, he'll be nice to you if you're nice to him, or something like that, along those lines." You know. So, I, and I, I didn't know it was Eleanor. I just thought I'm just ringing a few people and seeing, get some pointers, and maybe somebody knows him. You know. But I actually rang and spoke to Eleanor. I do remember knowing that after the event. Uh, wow! So, wow! Yeah, How did you yeah. feel about realizing that you were asking? So, so I had his, I had his phone number. I had his phone number. Uh, because of that, because it was in the book, but not under Keith's name, under Eleanor's name. So, um, so I went down, and then I, I, I hired a little cottage, and I went down for a week, and there was a pub opposite the cottage called the King's Head in Hailsham. And I used to, I was on my own, I didn't know anybody, and I'd just go into the pub for a drink and for lunch. And I, and I befriended a guy, actually, there, who, who was from Manchester area, and he lived down there. He had, he had a business, uh, I think he... he um, ex uh, conservatories and windows and stuff and uh -huh. um i got friendly and chatting and um and he sort of said things like i know somebody uh, who uh, uh, 
he was a hairdresser who used to go up there. And I think I'm not, and he, and he, this guy, I did, I only just met him and he used to like take a day off work and we'd jump in his car and he'd drive around thinking, I think that's it, I think that's it. And it was, it was all wildly out. It was all wildly out. He was wrong, but he was helping me, you know. And my week was, <laughs> my week was coming to a close and, uh, and I wasn't getting anywhere. And uh, I, I used to go up to the Six Bells, you know, and um, just sit around and say, you know, and have a beer. So I had a bit of a holiday. Yeah, and you hope, and you and hope, I, and you hope. And then one night I was playing pool in the King's Head, which is the pub opposite which, where I'd hired my cottage. And, um, and I'm chatting and uh, there's a chap in there who worked for the local council who emptied all the... Um, um, the uh, you know the, they don't have um, dr um, sort of s uh, sewage pipes. It's all these uh, you know the chemicals have to have to go around and shovel it out. After, what do they call them? These these tanks. Septic tanks. Yeah, Septic yeah. Tank, yeah. Septic tanks. So, so this, chap said, this chap said to me, "I know him. I'll get you his address because we have to go and empty his tank." So this this guy was shoveling Keith's poo, you know. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> So, so basically, he got me this address, and uh, and I just made my way up there and um, rang rang the doorbell, and Keith's mum, Dorothy, answered. I remember. I think Damon was next to her, and Damon's arm was in plaster. It wouldn't must have been Damon because he was a young lad, and uh, and. Tom's muted for some reason. Tom, Tom, I think you've accidentally muted yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. And Ed's muted as well for some reason. Hang on. And I, yeah, Tom, you're. You, yeah, can you hear me now? Go. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Can you hear me now? Okay, everybody's yeah. back. Yes. Everybody's I, I, we'd, back. Got, we'd got as far as uh, there was young lad Damon was there. Yeah, Damon yeah. was at the, at the door uh, and um, he, he was. Uh, he was um, sort of like, you know, just behind his, his, his granny and um, and Dorothy was talking to me and I remember his arm was in plaster. Um, so um, she said uh, he's, he's not in, um, he's, he's, at, he's at Jim Davidson's um, wedding and uh, he'll be back tomorrow. I said, okay, I'll come back tomorrow then. And she said, okay, I'll, I'll tell him you called. Mm. So I came back the next, next night, next evening and um, I think this was a Thursday. And, um, and I'm walking between the gate and the house and I could hear tires behind me. So I stopped and it was Keith in a Volvo estate. So basically he gets out of the car and he kept, he was behind the door, you know, what do you want sort of thing? So I just said, <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I'm, I said, I'm, I'm Tom and I, I had some cassettes with me and uh, some, <laughs> photo, some photographs, you know. Um, you're I, not I, crazy. You're not. You're I, not a crazy person. I've taken. I've taken some photographs of Greg at Umis because we got on the coach. Remember, I was telling you the guy, tell it, the the lighting guy at the Greg's gig, and I had some, and, he, and he had a look, and he said, and he, and he just he never. He, he didn't know me from Adam, and he'd never met me before. And I said, I play keyboards, and here's some tape of my original stuff with this band I had been in, and and he said, um, do you know where the Six Bells is? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, I'll, I'll see you there. To, I'll see you there tomorrow <laughs> lunch. Know. I'll see you there wow. tomorrow lunchtime. So, so the next day, um, and we, we sat there for about th two or three hours. I remember he had a streaming cold and we ate lunch and he drank, <laughs> drank he said, I'll drown me cold uh, in this. He bought a bottle of wine and drowned his cold. He was there in his Morgan, turned up in his Morgan. I've got some photographs of us standing in the car park, you know, but we, we got talking and uh, he was saying, oh, this, this uh, chap who used to do the Hammonds, um, you know, this chap called Bill Hoff had disappeared off the face of the earth and he couldn't find him. And uh, I said, I've got all the, all the workshop manuals. So I said, I'll send them you, you know, I'll get them photocopied. And I photocopied them and sent them and, I, and they started writing me letters and stuff. And I, you know, and I had his phone number, obviously. And, uh, and then I just started thinking, well, I'm just working on something here and, um, and I'm a bit stuck. So I think I'll just ring Keith. <laughs> so, so I used to just ring him. And then sometimes, Why not? <laughs> more, more, so, more often than not, um, he wouldn't be in like Eleanor might say, um, or oh, he's, out, he's out jogging. Or he used to, he, I think he used to run around the, 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 the lanes, you know, so ring back later. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, it, it taught me through stuff and, you know, so. 
so basically that was it really and then and after that just used to go down and just uh visit that friend of mine i found who who befriended me in the pub we used to go and visit him regularly and then we used to ring keith and say you're coming for a beer and uh, she'd say uh, eleanor would say oh he's in japan probably with the best or something you know it, it, more often than not he wasn't around but if he was he'd always come out and um, meet us suggest a different pub to make it interesting you know <laughs> That's, you know, that's a, quite an amazing story. I mean, to be able to just walk up to somebody's door, somebody yeah. you, you, you really, um, I don't want to say idolize, but that you really respect. Mm. And to, to meet him would be a really big deal. And here you are, <laughs> you just walk up to the door. <laughs> you know, keep. <laughs> I told him, you know, I said, I said, you know, I'm playing in this tribute and I'm, I've got problems with this, that and the other. So I'll, uh, I'll just ring you and ask you, you know, I mean, I used to ask him, you know, the fingering for hoedown and he used to send me, I mean, obviously we started, uh, he, he got a computer and uh, did emailing. So he'd email me the fingering, you know, and he, and he, he, he actually even emailed me the, the, uh, the printout for the, you know, the 24 note sequence at the end of Carnival 9, hand, handwritten, oh, you know, no yeah, yeah. So, oh, you're kidding! Yeah. <laughs> oh, another yeah, favorite. Then, then I used to go down there and we'd meet in a pub, and he'd have Lee Jackson with him. So then uh -huh. uh, I got I got friendly with Lee, and Lee, Lee calls me the ever-present Tom Zachary. He just uh -huh. Tom just turns up at places. He's ever-present. <laughs> Lee uh, <laughs> at, at the. Um, gig in the trading boundaries that uh, Noddy's Puncher played and uh, Lee Jackson guested with them uh, and, and, and did a bit of a speech at the beginning and introduction. Um, Sorry. One of the tales that he told was the first time that he met Tom. <laughs> um, and that was, at, he was, Lee was at Keith's house and there's this Strange figure at the bottom of the garden at the gate <laughs> trying to get in. And Lee said to uh, Keith, Who's that? Let me in. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Keith said to Lee, Oh, that's okay, that's my stalker. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually, um, went, in, went into Keith's. Went round to Keith's once and um, uh, Aaron answered the door and uh, I was with a friend of mine. Uh, we'd, we'd gone down to the area and uh, Aaron answered the door and said, oh, uh, dad's out shopping. He said, he, he said, uh, he said, you'd turn up. He says, he says, come in and wait. So, so uh, Keith and Ellen. You went into to Keith's house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we were there all God. afternoon. And then uh, it was just before Black Moon. He was, he had, um, he had. Two, the two piano pieces, um, Close to Home and Blade of Grass, and he took us to the, his music corner. He had these big tannoy speakers, I remember, the, you know, the fireplace and all the, you know, DAC player and all that, and he played the two piano pieces, and he said to me, which one do you reckon I should put on the album? <laughs> so, I don't know, which, I can't remember which one I said, but um, he did ask me. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it was the correct one. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, my goodness sake. Oh, and then, then um, I was playing that, the score. That takes a lot of guts. I was playing the score on his piano, baby grand. Uh, I can't remember what make a four letter name, and he said that's that's a piano. I, he said I think he said this piano I learned on. But it was it wasn't an upright. It was a baby grand. But I was playing the score, and he said, "Oh, um, you're playing it wrong." He said. I said, "All oh, right." And he said, just hang on a second. He disappeared and he, he'd gone for a, He'd ripped a piece of sheet, uh, you know, sheet music out of a book. And he came back and he said, um, I'll write it on. He said, you don't mind me writing it on the back of this. Was it, um, uh, what was that track uh, they, they played uh, uh, with the best? Was it a John Entwistle track? Was it a Who track? Was it Boris Spider. Was it Boris the Spider? Or was it something called Too Late the Hero? Was it Too Late the Hero? I'll have to go and dig it out. But, but he said to me, you don't mind on the back of this? I said, no, no, I'll carry on. So he just basically wrote out the intro to the score there and then for me on the piano. And he was like playing it and uh, so he wrote it out. So he did things like that for me, you know. Really, really, really nice. It's incredible. 
That's yeah. really an incredible story. Yeah. That really is. Because I, I don't know a whole lot of people that would say, gee, I'm in front of Carl Palmer's house. I'd like to meet him. Hmm. Let me just go ring the doorbell. And of, of course, my Noddy Spongy started playing because I got friendly with the Six Bells landlord then. And he used to say, oh, come down and play. So it, it was a case of like, well, we need to do two nights to make it worth the trip because it's a long way and you have to bring all the gear. We have to stay somewhere. So we started, because they didn't, they didn't pay that much. People wanted to play at that place, you know, so they didn't pay a lot of money. And, um, and then Aaron started coming seeing us. So then Eleanor came to see us and Lee Jackson used to come and see us and Aaron, and Aaron was in bands and all these bands used to come and see us all these band members. So we, we, we sort of, like, over the years, just got, you know, I got friendly with Aaron. And um, uh, um, I think it was 94, we were playing at the Six Bells and Aaron had been there and his band mates were there and we were packing away and Aaron said, there's a, it's an open house if you want to come, we're having a party. He said, mum and dad are away. So, and, <laughs> and, so oh, and basically we packed the van. Party. We parked the van and I, everyone went home and I went up the lane and I parked outside uh, Stonehill and I knocked on the door and I went in and they were all having a drink in the kitchen and Aaron said, um, and it was when they were just about to get rid of the place to move, to move. and uh, Aaron just took me around every room in the house and uh, showed me every room, you know, upstairs in the attic there was a uh, pool table and um, and they, were, they took me in the barn and there was two pianos and I, I played stuff, you know, and, I, and there was a jacket and I tried the jacket on and it was like too tight, but I still carried on playing. And then there was a, a there was a, a Goff, Goff Hammond, I remember this, I've still got it, a Goff Hammond organ, like a shiny jacket. And, and Aaron said, oh, you can have that. So I took it. It was on top of the piano oh. in the barn. So I took it and I came home and all that. And, and I thought, Oh, damn. So I rang up and I spoke to Keith and I said, look, I said, um, I've just been down there gigging. And I said, and we've been in, you know, our any vipers in us and he's, he's given me this jacket. And I, and I thought I just took it because I was like, wow. I said, but I said, it's your jacket. I said, I said <laughs> you, you, you want it? Do you want it? I'll, I'll you give you it back. It. I'll give you it back because I think Aaron didn't ask you. I think it just Aaron just gave it me. And, and he said, nah, you can keep it. <laughs> So, oh <laughs> so I still got it. A Goff, a Goff Hammond organ jacket. Yeah. I would, ha I would have that thing in glass or <laughs> on my body every single day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, do you want to talk to somebody else now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Frank. Um, let's see now. There were some things that we talked about here. Now I have to go back to my other sheet here. Um, you have a um, list of songs that you do. And some of those songs I understand are songs that Naughty Punctures plays that either have never been performed by ELP or has only been performed a few times. Do you want to talk a little bit about what those songs are? Sure. We. Um... I mean, we play trilogies, one track that um, ELP probably only played three or four times, maybe, because back in the early 70s, 72, when they were doing it, um, they couldn't replicate all the various sounds. Um, but today, with technology, uh, we're able to, to recreate that sound. And I mean, Ed's a big part of that, and he could probably explain it better. But um, there's a section in it where it's in a 5-4 um, section and ed uh plays that riff, riff with his with his feet um while tom's playing the, the solo on top on top so whether or not they didn't have that technology back there or whether greg wasn't able wow. to do it, thankfully ed can um, well, it was back in tapes frank I, yeah i think i think probably, probably for that to kick in at the right point carl probably have to listen to a click yeah and but the tapes used to chew up or stop on things right. so a bit of a disaster yeah. but... so it was a disaster but ed, ed can replicate that with the bass pedals so um we're able to perform that one um living sin's another one i don't know why LP didn't play that one live anyway i don't think it was i think it was just it's a song that never came on their radar perhaps to replicate live but we certainly do that one which uh, we we do enjoy doing um 
and then there's, there's um, we, we played to Carter, um, which EOP only played on one tour, the Brain and Surgery 73, 74 tour. Um, uh-huh. And we play that and we, and, um, we replicate that. I mean, maybe Tom can demonstrate some of the sounds. Um, uh, actually, that is a good demo for the Moog, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and I create Carl's percussion solo in there. So do the tints, uh, the, the tubular bells, um, oh and then, nice and then there's a synth solo where my drums are triggered uh from uh with some, there's some triggers uh installed on my uh on various drums so i've got two on the rotor toms of the high pitch toms i've got one on the bass drum a trigger on the one of the floor toms um and then i've got a pad next to me which triggers the 14 14 note sequencer um so I, mean, I, don't, I haven't got the drums set up for that because Tom's got the drums down there. But the sounds... yeah, I, I kind of I kind of built all that, didn't I, Frank? Yeah. Sort of, uh, what what we've got is a uh, a roll and drum pad, which you can actually program sounds into. But you can actually convert each pad to a MIDI trigger, which then my Alesis keyboards I can burn samples to cards. Um, so I, I've got I'm. This is what can Frank you demonstrate, Tom? A demonstrate, little bit about that. I can that. demonstrate, but every time I hit a note, that would be Frank hitting a certain pad because I've actually built uh-huh. these triggers. So the triggers go onto certain pads. So you've got things like. Oh, <laughs> that's it. So the guy play a drum, those, those sounds, um, which are similar to the, the sounds that Carl got from his... Um, the, his the, uh, sample, his, the samples, we, we, with the samples from Carl's. Yeah. Well, that one is anyway. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how we got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would. Um, and then I think, as I said, we alluded to earlier, we, um, we try and approach the tracks... Um, uh, and listen to the live versions. And from a from a drummer's point of view, um, I think Carl's drumming is like an extension of his personality. He's a very very um, energetic, um, lively kind of um, uh, hyper kind of individual. And um, and I've known him. I've known him for years. Known him very very well. Spent a lot of, awful lot of time with him. So I know what he's like as a character. And I think that comes out in his drumming. You know, his drumming is always on the edge. It's it's kind of fast and um, and it's pushing. Oh, all the time. Yeah. And um, and I think from a drummer's point of view, what I try and do is, is kind of imagine or get into his head how he approaches the songs. And um, I mean, I was listening to a bootleg the other day, um, Madison Square Garden, one of the three gigs they did in '77. And I listened to uh, Carnival Nine, Impression One, Part Two. And it was so fast, as fast as I've ever heard it. And, I, and on that night, Carl must have been drinking loads of coffee or something. Because <laughs> uh, I remember John Wetton famously said that um, Carl makes coffee nervous. Um, but, and he, he raced away with it. And that's the thing with Carl's drumming. It's, it's, it's not a steady in the pocket metronomic um, uh, kind of style of drumming. He's very organic and he goes with how he's almost feeling on the night and sometimes he, he, you know, he, he follows Keith and, and, and they're both, you know, kind of really pushing it and pushing it. And that's what, again, we have been criticised for sometimes playing the pieces too fast. Um, but that's because we're trying to get in the heads of, of uh, well, I am anyway, in the head of Carl and, 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 and they're really pushing and pushing and pushing. And you've only got to listen to some of these bootlegs and they really are, really are flying with the tempos. Um, and that was the exciting thing about their live performances. You know, they weren't they weren't sterile and metronomic and and kind of plodding along. They were really really pushing, and um, and that's what we try as best we can to, to emulate the the live feel, rather than trying to copy um, the um, the studio versions. Uh, and, yeah. And playing them to something like a click track because I don't think ELP pieces would work. Uh, with a click track, they're, they're more organic and they breathe uh, and they push. And depending on the night, some are some are taken a little bit faster than if you saw them three successive nights, you'd see them played potentially at three different tempos um, because it's an extension 
uh, of, of how they are feeling. That's what, that's what we try and recreate, I think. Can I, can I jump in there? Go on then, Tommy. Yeah? You're um, in. Uh, you know what, what Frank was saying? I mean, at the moment we're working on the um, on, uh, third impression, um, which I'm, I'm just learning. Um, but uh, I, I think I think Ed suggested we, we do this one. Uh, and I said, okay, um, but if we do it, I said, I want to do it in the the live key, which ELP did it, because obviously they, they transposed it, didn't they, down. And I said, and, uh, I want to do the Cal Jam version. So I don't want to do the, the organ solo, which everybody um, knows off the, you know, I mean, ELP, uh, Keith did that organ solo. I mean, the Cal Jam one, just a totally different organ solo. So um, basically, uh, that's the way I've learned it uh, and I've been practicing it. And it's same with pirates as well. Um, you know, you, uh -huh. uh, people sort of, uh, I, I, years ago I saw, I can't remember who, who, who did it now, but you know, emulating the orchestral and stuff. I just wanted to emulate the GX1. So I, I did that, approached it that way with the, with the, uh, with pirates as well, just, uh, Pirates alone, if I could, you don't I could mind demo, my jumping in. I could demo in. those sounds for you if you want, the, uh, the GX1 sounds. Oh, yes, please. But b before that, Ka uh, um, um, Frank was talking about um, Takata. And uh, I wanted, oh, to, yes. I wanted yes, to show yes, you yes. that because uh, there's, there's, a, there's a thing about there's lots of these little switches that I've built myself which are coming to play. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, why is that not working? <laughs> oh, I know why. See, there's little switches everywhere because I don't have presets, so I tend to forget. There was one there, and, there's, and you do hold down, and that one's down, and it should be up for the next one. It's happened live as well. But then there's this... Um, one one oscillator goes down, so so I'll go from there. So and there's a delay. And then the other one goes up to So the two together. And then of course you give it a little bit of modulation. And then, of course, you want that ring modulation. So I've built a little circuit with a switch here. So you go. Yeah? Ah. Uh. Things like that. <laughs> just like all, uh, these, all these little boxes like I've built with switches everywhere. And you've got to remember on the gig, right? That one's on, that one's off, that one's on. And that's four for different numbers. It's just like so that's much. Not, that's crazy. Oh, I don't know how, Tom, you keep it up because I don't know. I either. noticed that you're constantly switching gears and, and changing knobs and yeah. you're, you're back on the keys and, and you're kind of going well, back well, and forth. For, for, and... for Takata, you get rid of that, you see. You get rid of the, that sort of a... Uh, you get rid of the... Uh, you know, the actual... You get rid of that and you get the filter in. You get the filter into play. Oh, my. And later on, you, you get rid of it and you go. Yeah? <laughs> There's a lot. Hey, great job on that, Tom. You know, Takata was the very first prog song that I ever was, was yep. the, the, my, boy, my boyfriend at the time played for me. I had no idea what Prague was. I had no idea about 
who ELP was, though, he said, well, I'll play you this. And Takata was my introduction. You got this ELP. as well, you know. You got uh, this as well. I'll give, you, I'll, give you, I'll give you a demo of that, yeah? Yeah. Uh, basically, the ribbon controller. Have you got the pyros in it, Tom? <laughs> 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 what, what Keith did was he got a drone going, so you, you get an oscillator and you take it, you take it off, the, uh, off the keyboard, off the, off the, off the, off the, off the uh, ribbon controller, so you got a... So I'm, I'm actually triggering the Moog off here now, when I touch the ribbon. But then you, you can pick, you can, it'll just play whichever note you last hit. So that's a drone going, and you pick a middle note, and then and then you actually play another oscillator with. Yeah. And then uh, to do the uh, machine gun thing, I didn't want to ruin mine, so I put a little, screwed a little uh, wire there. And if you sh if you lick your finger, and you. Ah, very nice. <laughs> Very, very nice. See? Simple. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I, I just, I'm just amazed at everything that all three of you do. Like, for instance, Frank, I was going to ask you something um, regarding uh, the speed that that you would that you would watch Carl play at. And the one question that came to my mind that you'll be able to answer, I think, is I had heard that Keith and Carl uh, or Keith would start to challenge Carl on how fast Carl could play. And Keith would sometimes play a little faster than say they, they practiced or what have you. And then it was this kind of game thing of Carl watching Keith and watching for that moment when he plays and it was like a contest to keep up. Is that true or is that just a story? It could be elements of that. I mean, if you listen to the Welcome Back album, the live album, uh, I mean, Keith dictates, particularly in Hoedown, he'll dictate the tempo with the, with the swoop which I know Tom dictates the tempo of the track with the swoop at the beginning. And also, if you listen to Tarkas, they don't have the build-up, the, uh, the voices. Uh, Keith just counts it in. One, two, one, two, three, four. And Carl's got to go with that, you know. So, um, you know, they, they did take the tempos at an incredible uh, pace. Um, but then if you watch in the 90s, 92 onwards, they, they kind of let, let, laid it back a little bit and... Um, and let the music breathe a bit more. But I think there was definitely in the 70s. Um, I'm not sure they were trying to compete out compete each other. I think they were just really trying to impress uh, the watchers, the audience, you know, how, how great they were and how fast they could play. Um, yeah. You know, I think it was more about, you know, getting people's jaws to drop, really, and looking at the, at the, right. the, just the performance levels. I mean, they, some of these gigs were two and a half, maybe approaching three hours long. Um, and the stamina they had was incredible, superhuman almost. Um, I, I don't time, know how they were the able to... The first time I saw them, um, the first time I saw Emsling and Palmer live was um, on the Black Moon tour up in uh, my Newcastle. And um, I noticed that uh, with the advent of MIDI and how you can control things off a single keyboard, that uh, Keith introduced uh, a lot more orchestration into his pieces. Uh, so mm -hmm. they were playing, they were playing uh, things like pitches and exhibition, but it was more, more of the uh, the traditional uh, arrangement to that. It wasn't, it wasn't the uh, the the one at the, the city hall, which was uh, in 71, 72, whatever. Um, it was right, far more. Right far more um, textured and lots more uh, sound, uh, orchestral sounds and uh, a, different, a different sort of uh, arrangement to it. 
And uh, also, it was like what Frank said, it was uh, the tempos were a little bit more uh, laid back and um, more measured. It wasn't as frantic it was, it was it used to be when uh, they first started. Also, Ed, on the Black Moon tour, Keith had um, Will Alexander off stage changing all the patches for him. Mm. Really? Yeah, yeah. He had, uh, you know, setting all the patches up and stuff. So you need, you, you know, with all that stuff, with all them buttons and that, you know, you have a guy at the side of the stage and maybe even between a number has to press a button and uh, on these MIDI switches or whatever and, uh, and it all changes and, you know, Keith's relying on this guy to the side of him to change all the patches with all the, you know. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, you know, why not? You know, I mean, anything that helps because Keith has got his hands full, you might say. But, but in this early music. 70s, he had, uh, he had, a box on the Hammond, and he had um, b buttons to change the presets of the modular. So he did that himself in the in the seventies. You can see him on Carl Jam video actually on, on the third impression, which I'm, I'm watching that video a lot now because I'm learning it. And uh, you can see him, you know, in certain pieces, you know, reaches up and reaches down and just presses a button, and it, you know, the, the moves reset. Yeah. That, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because people don't think about what goes on behind the scenes. You know, what help they're getting, who's watching what, um, you know, who's keeping an eye on Carl's equipment. And uh, there, there's it got to be, what, Ed, a whole crew of people that are just there to support and to uh, be ready to, say, change uh, guitar to bass or... Like uh, Tom, uh, I'm sure that you've uh, you've had uh, what Dave here uh, helping. Is that right too? Uh, helping? Uh, how do you mean? Kind of, um, Dave. Um, you are the for Naughty Puncher, the sound engineer. Yeah. Yes. So, so basically, uh, I drive the mixing desk. These guys, they're not playing Mustang Sally in the local pub. Um, you get different sounds coming at you at different levels from all directions. So it's a, it's an exciting uh, thing to behold. There's a lot uh, going on, of... and Dave has to stay on top of it all just as much as we do, because if Frank's hitting some tubular bells sounds on the pad, Dave has to know that's coming up and it has to be heard. Yeah. To sort of, you know, sure. the, you know, it might only come up once and it, it has to be heard and uh, the moment's gone. If you've missed it, you've missed it. So you know? For that sound, and I have to be that riding the be fader. A good thing. No, no. I think Dave, you get in a little bit of trouble if you miss one. But, I bet but you apart, don't apart either. from that, Dave also helps me uh, pack the gear into the, the trailers and pack, get the gear upstairs and, you know, and then unpack oh, it again. Oh, my goodness. Gear. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, that's kind of, how do you do that? What's your process for uh, breaking down the equipment for Tom and getting that loaded? Tom has a great deal of ingenuity about how everything packs away within itself. Um, the ribbon controller lives within the top cabinet on the Moog. Uh, for in, traveling around, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that goes inside the back. Um, it's made a special compartment in the flight case for the modular that the keyboard sits inside of. Every single little bit, it's all custom gear, it's not off the shelf, it's all been modified. And obviously, uh, in packing up that gear. Then, this is why uh, this is why when people say can you come to america we'd have to take i'd have to take i can't just oh we'll get you a modular it's not it's, you couldn't do it you know somebody mm. gave me a modular in america i couldn't do what i do with this because it's mm. custom well we gotta we gotta do like a fundraiser or something where we all donate towards getting you guys out here to america do some stuff back east do some stuff midwest and come out to the west coast and do some stuff there because you, you know there's i i know i am just dying to to see you guys in person because uh tom i understand that you perform just as keith did uh when he performed as far as everything from the knives to playing backwards to uh the whole bit 
and uh, I, I try. I do try, but it's not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, time will do that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I was I was much more sprightly before my uh, motorcycle accident. So um, I used to like just jump off the top of the hammock. I can't do that now. But um, we have the. Uh, we have tentatively been discussing the idea of um, of doing something and maybe streaming it um, so that the people in America can can see us live. Um, and it's only in the initial discussions at the moment. I know it's something that Ed um, was sort of brought it up. I think initially, is that right? Ed? Um, you just did one with the, your Bowie band, didn't you? The idea of streaming it. Yeah, it just seems um, maybe a way to uh, to get our sound um, heard by by fans in in America and other parts of the world, uh, because the the logistics of getting something like this um, across the Atlantic is just horrendously it's just uh, too much. Yeah, it's just you know the the actual weight of the equipment and what have you. You'd have to have replicas abroad, which. Uh, as Tom said, uh, you, you can't replicate what he's what he's actually created himself. No, <laughs> so no, we can. just thought that um, maybe maybe uh, a live stream performance is the way forward. I mean, that's we've been in lockdown for months now, and um, lots of bands are are doing this, uh, um, doing the live stream performance. And uh, I just thought that maybe it's a way to to uh, let the uh, the people in other countries see the band live, you know, but uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm I, sure there's a lot of us that would love to see I've you had a thought on that. I've had a thought on that and we've not actually discussed it as a band. So this is the first time the guys are hearing that. Uh, um, uh, it's it's uh, uh, this, this live streaming of a gig is a good idea, but obviously you need to get together to do the gig. Yeah, uh, and I, I understand think... that you guys are not quite next to each other. No, we're not. We're hundreds of miles Explain apart. how you guys do this. How do you guys do your rehearsals and... Um, well, we, we, uh, we uh, basically uh, have a program which we can all link up to uh, and I'm, I've, got a, I've got a central server which I'm hiring, um, which we log into and um, basically we, we uh, get just a few... I'm, I think I'm down to about 34 milliseconds delay. Uh, if you did, you see the pictures at an exhibition we did recently. Ah, uh, yes. Yep. No, that, beautifully that, done. That, that, that beautifully was, done. I was going to talk to you about that a little. That was Ed, that was Ed's idea to do something, um, and basically, uh, I, I, I analysed what other people do, and what I think what other people do is they when they do collaborating, they um, they they get a, a track recorded and uh, get the, get it recorded as well as they can. Um, and then basically um, video of themselves playing along to it or maybe miming or whatever, I don't know, uh, can, you know, sync it all up. And then, and then that's, that's the collaboration, that's the video. And I said, well, for a start, what we'd have to do is either record the bits ourselves. And I, I mean, as far as recording, I'm still on reel to reel quarter inch tape and uh, an old Atari ST for sequencing. <laughs> so I don't do this computer recording. Uh, I know Frank doesn't. Um, so our only uh, option would be to go into a studio. Well, with the lockdown, we couldn't even do that. So I had the <laughs> idea. I, I said, guys, I said, why don't we just video ourselves as we're doing this online rehearsing? Um, I said, I'll just record my headphone feed. We'll see what it's like. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's, a glitch. there's the odd glitch and pop and fart, you know, but, um, you know, if it's, if it's all right. So, so we, just, we just did it. Um, one night, we you know we uh, we spent a few hours and went through stuff a few times, and uh, and then I synced it all up, and I, I think rather than do a gig um, lack, lack of performance, this is my idea, and um, we've got to discuss it yet, but um, we would basically need to take or meet up. We all, everybody comes to wherever we have to hire a place, then we need a, you know a camera crew, and then and then of course mixing it with, uh, for Dave, it would be like. When you're playing in a, in a hall, you're hearing the PA. Well, if you're going to stream it, everything needs to be mic'd. It would be, be a mixing nightmare, really. I'm just thinking, why don't we do what we did before and, and link Zoom up with our rehearsals? 
we could actually sort of uh, say to people, look, we're rehearsing and we'll be going through pirates three times or somebody might, people don't like pirates sometimes. They say, oh, I preferred uh, ALP Keith of the Hammond and the Moog. Well, then they don't have to tune in that, that week, you know, they can wait till we do. Yeah. But we could no, have pirates is quite it's quite a number to even learn how to how to how to sing and you hear the changes in the tempo is is just unbelievable to try to learn how to sing that song and that is not easy and it's not easy to play for Tom and for Ed and for Frank it has it's 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 a difficult song it's a it's a beautiful song ed i think you were talking about how it's it's really a story that you have to learn yeah it's uh the the, the lyrics are, are huge I mean, it takes a long time to actually learn the lyrics without learning to pitch and sing the song sing the lyrics uh and then um having to put that to greg lake's bass lines uh, it, it is it is quite a challenge. It really is. It's sort of like uh, doing that drum. Yeah. The <laughs> the no, that's that's exactly right. I mean, I've I've been actually trying to um, memorize the lyrics, and because I love certain parts, you know, where Greg goes such changes his tempo to go very very fast. Um, Bones and beaches, and you know, so on. Yeah, so on. Wine. <laughs> <laughs> can I just can I just say that, that Ed doesn't have an auto cue at all? So the lyrics to not only parts but the entire repertoire is in his head. So um, fair dues. How we? I mean, she's it, it complicated enough, and yet Ed, you got it right up, right up here. That's what you got to do. You got to learn things. It's no good if you if you try if you try to uh, have cue cards and read the lyrics in front of you, uh, it would be instantly noticeable, and uh, people would see that, and you would not be able to perform. You it needs to be in there. It needs to sort of be automatically played, and uh, yeah. you need to. It's not just playing. It's not just uh, singing. It's actually performing as well and uh, yes. entertaining people who are watching the band. And I'm just standing there like that. I think it goes back to what Ed was saying earlier, that because we've listened to the music for years and years and years, it's just in there. And um, uh, I'm sure that's, that's um, the same for all of us in terms of learning and remembering the pieces. It's just something that's, that's just always will be in there. I think it's also, um describes the quality of your uh, songs that you do play that because you have them so memorized and you've obviously been fans of their music and uh, each one of the members themselves that um, you just, uh, it, it, it comes out in, in the performance in the videos that I have seen um, I'm really impressed with the quality of each one of you. You, you definitely, you definitely have my uh, hats off, hats off to you, all of you, for uh, taking that time to memorize those things, and so that they do look like the, the, the true performance, and you're not looking at like, like uh, as just like cue cards and things like that and Tom you, you you've got to have a real challenge too there with uh, pirates and with pictures um it, it, all of you I don't know how you do it well you've got to play it you got to if I don't play pirates for a couple of weeks uh, and I try I'll, I'll just forget with pirates for me I could demonstrate it for you because uh, Please. I, I, I've, I've set up sounds and I have to do little switches to get a different sound at, at a moment's notice or during a certain piece while I'm playing with my left hand, I have to pull the, and I, I've done things like the modulation wheel on the synthesizer. I've programmed the, mod, the module it's controlling to, to be, become a fader between two patches. Or if I put it mm -hmm. central, I can get the, you know, it's, um, let me just switch over to it because uh, I'll just show you. I mean, this, 
Am I prepared for this now? I don't know whether I've... Let's just see whether this... Basically, the you know the, um... and then you've got this other keyboard here, which is going. Yeah. And then if you don't change your, as that happens live actually, if you don't change your patches, there we go. So if I, I've got that sound, and I can go. And then, and then you got that. And there's different switches. There's actually on the on the lower keyboard. There's two buttons. It's an ensonic, and you can actually change mute, mute and unmute oscillators. But the the more mentary switches, so you have to keep your fingers on them. Of course, I can't do that. So I've actually took the keyboard apart and I put a toggle switch across them, so I can actually make it permanent. So it, you know. Very nice. Yeah. So. <laughs> And then, of course, I've had to modify this keyboard to get this uh, aftertouch. Oh, oh. oh man, that is that's great. Uh, Pirates is a is a really great number. Yeah. So it's quite uh, quite convoluted. So like I say, if I don't play it for a week or two, I come back to it and I'm just messing up because I've just, it's not only the playing, it's like all the switches and <laughs> it's muscle memory and you've got to just keep on top of it. Yes. That's the only, only way you can you do, do it. it. So, yeah. I, I, does, did, now has Keith taught you or worked with you on your, um, on your keyboard and ways to play or ways to program things? No, not, not to program things. He's, he's helped me out with the uh, different bits when I've asked him. Um, I've asked him I've asked him technical stuff about the Moog and he's uh, he's forwarded my email to people um, who, who he worked with and said, uh, Tom's got this question, can you answer it? So then I'll get a, uh, a reply from Keith Weschler or, you know, somebody. Um, ah. So I'd, I'd send the question to Keith, and then he would he'd have, he'd send it to somebody else and say, "Can you can you answer this for Tom?" <laughs> That's great. That's so great. You got a team there. <laughs> and uh, let's see. It seems to me that was there another question that I had on hand here. Um, we talked about the sounds of of hoedown, and you know I want it thank each and every one of you for your demonstrations, uh, taking the time to, um, to play for us. Uh, it's a real treat. And um, Ed, like I said earlier, you have a spectacular voice and you play Lucky Man beautifully. And it, it only makes me hungry to, to, to want more. You know, I was like, I'm ready to buy my plane ticket and get on over there. <laughs> mm. Now, well, you know, there hopefully is one... you... we go don't ahead. know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know where it's going to go with uh, with COVID-19 and uh, restrictions, yeah. uh, audience restrictions yeah. and uh, where where live music is going to go. So uh, we'll have to wait until uh, next year, maybe to see see how it goes. But I think uh, I think we'll we, we will do um a convention next year and also uh we have uh, a rescheduled isle of wight gig which is uh reenacting the uh, 1970 isle of wight show right uh, which... uh, yeah i was going to ask yeah. you guys i was going to specifically ask 
calm about that. Um, I saw an announcement, you know, said that the Iowa White White organizers decided to finally um, admit that it's not going to happen this year um, and just, you know, just postpone it by a year. And I was talking to, um, because obviously um, David and Jason Woodford were coming over to do the, um, to this a sort of a, a test um, that was one of the attractions, like a test run of the, the, the documentary, which they would have ready for then. And um, I was speaking to David and uh, he said, he, he sort of planted the seed of like, well, why don't we, if you delayed it and did it around the same time as the Isle of Wight, then people who want to go to the Isle of Wight and the convention can actually come over. And if it's quite close, they can stay over, you know, if it's a week or two. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was excited when I read that because I wanted to go to both, but they were so far apart from each other. I I didn't like having to pick one over the other because both are... um, But the the convention is quite good. I mean, Robert Berry was talking about coming over, uh, but then he he didn't know, see what he's doing near the time, um, you know, uh, trying to coordinate stuff. But I've, I've, I've got in touch with Pete Sinfield. I've got in touch with um, people who used to work for, you know, uh, it, it, with the LP on the, on the PA. Well, one guy, uh, one guy who worked for IES, the, the PA company. And he also was Carl's drum roadie at some point, And he helped um, design the uh, stainless steel kit. Uh, I, you know, so ah. I've, I've, I've tracked down a lot of people and um, yeah. Uh, it'd be it'd be good to have, uh, and we've got loads of stuff, loads of ideas, basing it on the, the one twenty five years ago, but uh, making it you know even bigger and better. But it, the place I found has only got two hundred and fifty places, so if we don't sell the two hundred and fifty seats, then because uh, it's going to cost a fortune to to actually put on. So we need to make sure that we all um, give our. Uh, darned us to get over there and, and get mm. our tickets so that um, we can make sure that this all comes together. But, but here's one for you, going back to um, to Dave. Um, Dave, Dave, had a, Dave had a suggestion recently, which uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should... Um, we, we, we want to be the first to do things, you see. Cause he, oh, yeah, like, no, 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 Dave. It, it, could, it could be done at the convention, couldn't it, Tom? Well, it could be done. It could be done uh, regularly elsewhere. But um, yes. because we're, we're learning third impression. What else did you do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, only, I'm only just learning. I'm only just learning this, so... Your program, I am yourself. Load your yeah, the robot voice. Yeah, yeah. Load your program, I am yourself. So uh, <laughs> Dave had this idea. He said, uh, when we do the third impression, he said he'd like to do a gig in quad, like ELP did with, with four. Oh, things. nice. So uh, it's me, it's me, them to me to build stuff again. I'm going to do it. <laughs> we're going to do, we're going to do a quad PA and have the uh, sequence going round. So yeah. That Tom, be, uh, you, you build it and I'll carry it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we decided we're going to do quad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's just going to sound so good. Oh, that's going to sound wonderful. My and, problem is uh, I can't talk and play. So if I'm, if I'm playing, I can't speak. So it, it throws me. I, so I would think to... that. I don't know how <laughs> anybody does that. You know? You know? Sit there and talk and play at the same time. I mean, keyboards, what, you have your feet going. You've got, you know, your, your left uh, and right hands going in different directions, and you're thinking about the buttons you have to push. And I don't you know, listen to I, some I bootlegs. Takes... You listen to some bootlegs of Keith going off on one in in uh, in um, solos. He sometimes does this kind of thing. Yeah. (laughs) 
sometimes it gets the Morse code going with the fil- with the uh, fil- <laughs> fixed filter bank with the with the wind. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. 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 You guys are going to sound great. Really Things like that, little little that. bits of, you know, in the middle of his solos, he used to just uh, go into something, you know, different noises. Yeah. Little things well, like that. Really... And of course, you, you know, when Ed's, when Ed's singing in Tarkus and he's doing, you know, Confusion will be my epitaph, yeah? And I, I do the yeah. old, uh, I do the old, Keith did that as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Little things like that. I can it's, recognize a lot of those sounds. Yeah. You know, it's I'm the using. attention to detail that's the thing, isn't it? It really Little is. nuances, yeah. Yeah. Things that that um, you don't think about, you know, when you think about the whole song, but when you break it down like what Tom's doing, it's recognizable. And there's also, you know, the end of Carnival Nine, first impression, when there's that big glide up. Yes. You know the old. I'm waiting. You know, I'm waiting for you to get to Carnival Nine and do a little, you know. You know. Now, uh, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but that glide on the modular is logarithmic. It's exponential, whereas a mini Moog is linear. So what happens to the modular Moog is you hit a note at the bottom and you hit a note at the top. And the note Uh rushes up to the top. And as it gets nearer the top, it starts slowing down. Yeah? Now, you, you, that's what you need at the end of Carnival 9. A mini Moog linear portamento won't cut, won't cut it. Yeah? I love it. Uh, uh, am I going to... Are you going to play Keith, for... Keith used to do is uh, put it through the uh, reverb. like that yeah 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 now now I, I, i'm waiting to hear you know that part of carnival mine i think we talked about it. i think it was either i've the just done it of... load your program. i know but i mean that part just before greg oh yeah yeah, yeah 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 that's the one that's it How are you doing is you're just pushing down on one key to make that yeah. sound repeat itself. Yeah, it just I, I have a foot pedal. I have a foot pedal and I, it carries on until I, st- I take my foot off. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorite uh, sounds. You know, and it's a carnival mine. And, and Sam, just it's called that. the sample and hold. Sample and hold. 
Oh, well, in fact, speaking of that now, uh, at the end of pictures, you know, we do pictures with there's a cracking effect where you've got the, uh, I'll get the mini move on the sample and hold, and then I can go. It's not, not doing it at the moment. It's setting, but it's not a. Uh... Anyway, yeah, it's what I do is I get that doing the sample and hold. For some reason, it's not doing it, and I'm probably just getting a bit. Uh... Hmm, weird. Anyway, yeah, uh, what I do is I, I mix the two. So I've got the modular, and the modular is going. I get the two going together. And Keith did that. Keith did that a lot with um, the two two oscillators. What one's on sample and all, and one isn't. And there's a glide, and he mixes the two together. Um, yeah. I think it, you hear that on the end of Cal, the pictures at a Cal Jam. It is a big glide up. Yes. Yes. I, uh, oh yes. Uh, yeah, pictures is a. Um... It doesn't always work. Because your switches might be in the wrong position or something, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's okay. All these things need checking beforehand, you see, and I didn't check that one. <laughs> well, that's okay. We'll, we'll give you we'll give you a break on that one. <laughs> It'll work next time, Tom. Don't worry. Probably. <laughs> All these things need, they need running it. through. I've done that before. Yeah. I've done it on a gig, and I've I've forgotten to just check something, and then you come to that part in the set, and then it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do? I mean, it, you know, stuff happens. Yeah. These are the bits where uh, Ed um, improvises in between numbers <laughs> uh, live uh, and tells an amusing tale whilst Tom <laughs> tweaks the sounds <laughs> out of the mood until he gets the nod and then off they go again. Oh, that's great. Yeah, okay, you got to keep it going. There's, there's nothing. I remember when I first got the modular and the hold down sound, and there was just one switch, and it was, and I, you know, I was just, I was overlooking it. And uh, that thing in front of the audience when they're all waiting, and it must, it felt like 10, 20 minutes. It must have been about a minute or two. Um, uh, it's just a horrible feeling when it just won't, it doesn't work, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's presets. The, Presets for you. No presets here. Yeah, yeah, no presets here, no. No presets here. All has to be dialed in manually just before you go. Yeah. <laughs> you must have, how long does it take you to um, set everything up prior to a show? Good few hours. I would think. Mm. Like a whole day? Well, if we do a, if we do one of our own gigs where we, well, I'm taking my PA system, well, obviously it needs a full day. If it's a, if it's a venue where they have their own PA, you just got to get this lot. But it still, you know, needs setting up and all, everything needs checking. I mean, I, I could do with like a pilot's checklist, you know, a pre-flight checklist. Yeah. You know, check, check the yeah. ticket out of it. <laughs> check, check, check that thing. I've just that just didn't work now, you know, because it could be yeah. just, just could be a cable I've forgotten to put in, you know. Never it's, know, uh, right? I'm sure Dave gets very busy too with a lot of that. <laughs> Probably between all three of you. Mm. Dave, that's got to be complicated for you too, um, taking care of the sound and um, helping out with um, you know little technical things here and there between you know Frank and and making sure his drum kit is perfectly tuned and in the exact place that Frank needs everything to be. 
And, well, for, fortunately, um, Frank can tune his own drum kit because I would be uh, completely lost on that one. No. But, <laughs> yeah, but, but you, the job, you, seriously, you have... the, the, the job is looking out for what could possibly go wrong, what people need, if they can hear themselves, um, if there's anything that can be done. Are there any tables to... in the way of the revolving rostrum? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Looking ahead for uh, how one can support. Really, uh, fast-moving face. I remember one gig when um, I don't know if you're in charge of pyrotechnics, but I think one gig um, the pyrotechnic went off and it went all over Ed, and, it, and I think it went. <laughs> really... No, no. What, what happened there, Frank? Was Ed's got a fan to keep cool? And oh the, yeah. The, py the pyrotechnic went off, and it was it was an old pyrotechnic which was a bit out of date because I use out of date ones. I, I don't eat out of date food, but I use out of date pyrotechnics. You know the the use by date had gone. So what happens? What happens is like they sort of burn a bit blacker, and it was like soot, and the fan caught the soot, and Ed was sweating, and the soot just hit him on the head, and he had all these black marks. <laughs> 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 now oh, that yeah. must have been quite a surprise, Hyatt. <laughs> yeah, a little bit strange, a little bit odd. <laughs> <laughs> One more for the book. <laughs> I'll bet you that yeah. frightened the daylights out of you when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Frightened well, a lot of people. Keep on going. Yeah, we will do, Dan. Thanks, thanks very much. <laughs> Well, um, I don't know if anyone has anything more they would like to talk about that we haven't covered that or that I missed. I'm fine. I'm right. good. I'm, I'm fine. I think we've done a okay. lot. We've, 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 we've talked a lot. We've, we've uh, explained a lot. We've done a lot of demonstrations. And I think people have got uh, quite an insight into how Nuddy's Puncture works now. So uh, that's, I what, we I wanted, do. that's yeah. what we want to do. I know. There is, yeah. There is I've got a, this, there is Diane. A I've yes. got this. Just to let people know that the, the CD with Keith Emerson on is still available. Oh, I didn't know you had that. Yeah. I just thought I'd throw that one it. in. Now, do you guys have, have T-shirts that you sell? Mm, <laughs> not really, no. We've not had any made. I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look into it. I think you should. Absolutely. We did have some t-shirts. Absolutely. We did have some t-shirts, uh, some really good ones made by uh, uh, Mark and Andrea Pettit, if, if my memory serves me correct, um, friends of ours who come to our gigs. They made some really good t-shirts, so uh, maybe we ought to get some made and caps and stuff. I think so. I mean, you know, and then let us know when you've got some things uh, available and on, on the merch side. I and mean, uh, this way, all of us everywhere can uh, walk around with Nadi's puncture on our backs. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, the front. Uh, I know I'd be speak. wearing mine proudly. <laughs> I think that would be a great idea. That'd be great. Right. You guys need to do. You guys need to do that. You really should, because uh, really there's a lot of people that would love to have one. But um, now, Tom, is there anything that we left out with you that you haven't covered yet that you feel that you want to still talk about? I think we covered everything, really. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, except your mood shirt. I think we're done. Your, your, think your we're done. shirt. <laughs> I've, done, I've done a lot of uh, demoing the mood and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, I think, and uh, your shirt. I love your shirt. Look at the gold on that. And your mood. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. It says it all. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. And Frank, um, anything we missed? No, I think um, as Ed said, uh, we've we've given hopefully everyone an insight into uh, who we are, what we're about, how we go about things. Um, I mean, what, if there is something we've missed, we can keep it back for the next time, maybe. So uh, we don't want to give it all away in one go. So. <laughs> I think that's a great idea because we definitely have to do this again. And um, in, in closing, I want to say on behalf of the Emerson, Lake and Palmer Titans of Prague site, 
all the members that were anxious to uh, view this view this interview to learn about Navish puncture and to gain more more information as to how you all work together. Um, we all are humbly thanking you for taking this time uh, for us, and uh, we appreciate this and. We do hope that we can get you back in and uh, talk some more about upcoming stuff. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, we'll do. I am. Thank you for arranging uh, this interview as well, because uh, obviously it's uh, quite a challenge to uh, pull something wow. like this together. So well done and thank you. Thank you very much. And, and Dave, I want to thank you especially for being our special guest. <laughs> today as well. Um, this was a real treat. And Tom and Frank and Ed, just your playing uh, for us is just uh, giving me chills. I just uh, know that everyone appreciated that. That was like a, a, a little surprise that uh, turned out to be really, really great. Really great. So thanks. I want to. Thanks very much, Dad. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dad. You. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Thank you, truly. And we will talk again. And this was Backstage Pass. And we will see you hopefully soon. And uh, take care. And uh, we'll say go on. Bye. 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 Bye.